So um, I just wanted to, to do a brief overview of, of plasticity oh. underlying learning in the brain. Uh, I've been asked by Ben and a couple of others to like talk a little bit about the biological side. And first of all, it's it's hard to when when talking about bridging AI and neuroscience, it's hard to know beforehand what could be relevant from biology and what is absolutely not relevant. So, for example, our recent work on dendrites in continual learning scenarios showed that uh, point neurons are definitely lacking in that department, and uh, they're missing dendrites and dendrite help with continual learning. But what I'm going to talk about, and, and hopefully we can discuss, um, don't hesitate to like interrupt and, and ask questions and things like that, because um, it would be more fun that way. Uh, but it's just, it's food for thought, right? It's not, it's not the complete set of mechanisms. It's not the full overview of what's happening in the brain at all time. Um, it's, it's still simplified and um, but hopefully it's enough for, for, uh, for you to, um, to, to think about some stuff that might be missing from, from AI systems and some stuff to dig around right. and dig in, right? Awesome. Uh, so learning can be studied uh, at different uh, levels. You have behavior, you have brain networks, you have specific brain regions, you have the neural novel, and then you can do protein and molecular pathways. So I'm not gonna talk about all of that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of that. Um, but the challenge is, is how do you reconcile all those level of analysis um, and, and how do you integrate those different views to come up with something coherent? So we're gonna to try to navigate those, those levels for, for a little bit. Um, if we go back to a while ago, uh, that's from the 70s, the classical experiments on, on long-term potentiation and long-term depression and spike time uh, independent plasticity, you can see on the left here that um, after um, titanic uh, burst stimulation, which is basically a high frequency stimulation of a neuron, you have for a while uh, an increase in the amplitude of how the neurons respond to stimulation. Um, so that's derived from uh, Hebb, from um, Blitz and Lomo's work. Um, and on the right here, you can see that classical figure of, of STDP, where if the uh, postsynaptic uh, uh, response comes from bef before the presynaptic one, you have a depression. And if you have the reverse, then you have a potentiation of the postsynaptic um, potential. Right. This is basically. It's a quick, Mm -hmm. Hey, Jeremy, just a quick uh, thing. Does everyone know what potentiation and depression means? You tell me. <laughs> uh, but I know what it means. I, I just don't know if people know what yeah, um, the phrase is. Yeah, yeah uh, please ask but questions. You might have to define it. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, please ask questions if you, if you feel like unfamiliar with some of the uh, jargon. Uh, I might have missed some stuff. Uh, so potentiation and depression are two opposite way a synapse can uh, respond to a stimulation. If you have uh, uh, on the left here, a depression, it means that after that event occurs, the synapse will respond less to the same type of stimulation, meaning the weight is gonna be um, less, uh, 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 reduced. And on the right, uh, it's reversed. The weight is going to be increased after a uh, stimulation for the same type of stimulation. So to make it clear? In this case, the same type of stimulation is an, an arriving action potential. In some sense. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But just to be clear, we're looking at single action potentials rise of the synapse. What happens? How much the neurotransmitter is released by that yeah. synapse? And, and this graph on the, the SCTP graph is also interesting because nothing like that ever happens in deep learning because there's no spike timing in deep learning. Everything is synchronous. And so the concept of something arriving before something else doesn't really occur this way in, in deep learning. And, and our theory is there's a very, very simple explanation for this. If you have some context that is making a prediction, if um, 
if the activity arrives before the context, well, the context couldn't have predicted the input, right? If the context is before the thing that happens, then it could be predicted. So you can look at this very simply saying, some event occurred, did it, that, is it a good predictor for what, what's happening next? And if, it, if, that, if that event occurs after the fact, well, it couldn't have predicted it, it couldn't have been useful. And that's why you, you want to get rid of that. And if, you, if, it, if it did arrive beforehand, you can say, well, that was a good predictor. That's a simple way of looking at it. Um, I, I often use that. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to this just very, very basic questions, Jeremy. Um, yeah, go ahead, please. You said, you said this is after stimulation of a synapse. So does this really mean yep. you stimulated the cell body with? No. Uh, um, that in that case, is different? In that case, you, you're going to, um, uh, it, it's been done in the hippocampus. And so you're going to stimulate the afferent nerve. So the nerve coming to the hippocampus, you're going to stimulate that very, uh, with a very high frequency. And then you're going to look at how um, the cells, the postsynaptic cell respond to that stimulation. So this is at a single synapse. Maybe it's not clear. This is looking at one synapse. This is a one synapse. Is yeah. There is an yeah. action axon coming to one synapse. And you have a spike on that axon, it releases some neurotransmitter, and then they measure the result on the other side. Yep. Yeah. So that's the, you, what you measure here so. is uh, due to uh, post synaptic changes that uh, uh, change the synapse efficacy and how it transmits information. And it changes basically, if you took an, take an analogy with uh, W. W increase with LTP and W decrease with LTD. That's the simplest analogy you could make, I think. Seems straightforward. And these are all with bursts of spikes, right? This is not with a single. Um, uh, uh, you need you need to 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 do LTP. You need high frequency simulation. Yeah. Yeah, but this spike timing is on a single spike. Yes. But this, to this generate is... uh, to generate the uh, the plasticity, you need high frequency stimulation. I did. Is that true in all cases? I didn't think that I, was true in all cases. I, uh, maybe not in all cases, but at least in the hippocampus, I think that's. that's maybe that's. I think if this is a general rule, it does not require uh, burst. I think they see this in peripheral cells on single spikes. That's possible. I'll, I'll need to yeah. check. I'm not entirely sure. But those, those experiments at that time definitely used uh, theta burst stimulation, so a very high frequency stimulation. Okay, is, is that clear? Um, yeah. What yeah. an STDP is? Okay, so because we, we're going to complexify a little bit afterwards. <laughs> 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 okay, so LTP, that what we saw is, is what we observe. The W we observe, right? It's as a synapse, how the W is modified. Uh, but in more details, that modification is not always the same. So what do I mean by that is, if you look at that graph, you can have late LTP or you can have early LTP. What that means is, if you have some stimulation, it can result in what's called early LTP. In that case, you have one train of stimulation. Let's think of it as, as a, um, a simple stimulation. And if you have four trains, let's think of it as multiple stimulation, then you, it's gonna result in what's called late LTP. And the major difference between those two is the amount of time the modification um, stays. Early LTP here after two and a half hours, you, you, you go back to the basal state of the synapse. It doesn't last longer than that. Late LTP, you see here after more than three hours, it's still there, right? The question is why? And then to know why, you need to go down one level from the neuronal level, the synapse level, to the molecular level. And that's what's on the right. Um, the details themselves don't really matter, but what you need to understand is that for early LTP, it's going to recruit molecular pathways and changes that stay mostly at the level of the synapse, so that part on the left. And then when you go to late LTP, you're going to recruit all of those molecular um, 
cascade that are up here, which then induce genetic modification or more precisely, um, are gonna change how the DNA is read and that is going to generate, for example, new receptors that are going to come back to the synapse and modify that synapse. So depending on the type of plasticity you have, the changes are gonna last more or more uh, longer for a very long time or for a very short time. Let me think of this as um, early LTP sort of leaves a kind of a, a short-term trace of activity in, in the actual synapses so that, you know, similar activity uh, that's occurs, you know, shortly after that will be more efficacious. Um, you know, whereas late LTP, you, you get, you know, really long-term changes, as you, as you say. I, I have two questions. Go ahead. Uh, the generation of the four trains, is that uh, the same stimulus occurring four different times or is it a yeah. replay mechanism? Yeah. No, it's, no, it's, no, I'm not talking about replay here. Just okay. four, four times the stimulation. Okay, and the second question is, when you say genetic changes, are you talking about epigenetic changes or conformational change? Yes. Uh, what do you mean conformational change? Uh, other things that change uh, how the uh, DNA is wrapped around the histone. Oh, oh. That's epigenetic, yeah. So yes. Well, okay. None of that's really important. What's What's important here is that I think so. You said it earlier, and since I said it, one is just a temporary change to the synapse. The other invokes what we often call meta metabotropic change. It's basically it invokes a, a metabolic complex chemical reaction where it, it produces proteins. And and as Jeremy said, one of the things that can happen, it can generate new. Uh, gates in the cell membrane. So imagine you have these, these modules, these, these molecules have to come across the gap there between the synapse and they have to find a receptor. If you have more receptors, then more can get in. So one is like a growth of physical change, physical change to the cell in the synapse and the other is just a chemical change that happens briefly. So that's the difference. And we've often, you're using different language we've used here in the past, uh, like the language of Merck Sherman, this would be a burst versus a, a single spike. Right, so you might have a burst of activity which could create this metabotropic effect, and then I think you're talking about this, Jeremy, and or a single spike would have a, a, a very temporary chemical effect in some sense. Is that consistent with your thinking, Jeremy? Yeah, it's okay. it's a gist of it. Yeah. So it looks like these four stimuli are like minutes apart from each yeah, other. Yeah, uh, is that right? It could yeah. be. It, it could, could be. be. Uh, yeah. It doesn't have to be, but it could be. Yeah, I don't know if it's the same as metabotropic. This might be different. Well, this is what he described is the metabotropic effect, yeah. which is you invoke a metabol a metabolic what's the right word pathway, in which essentially says, "Oh, turn on these genes, generate some proteins, build some new receptors, change the physical structure." Um, and it's not just uh, it's not just new receptors at the synapse. It also creates new receptors adjacent to the synapse. Uh, you've shown some of those there. Um, um, so it just phys one is a physical, morphological, or physical change to the cell. One is a temporary chemical change. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, let, let's let's simple and say, see it that way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, sorry. Uh, with the previous slide, I, I I think I have a question about the we talked about the the pulse versus a single. Yeah. Like I think the difference is whether the, there is an, um, the postsynaptic cell has an action potential or not. So in the left, I don't think the postsynaptic cell has any action potentials. You're just looking at the EPSP, whereas on the right to the STPP, yeah. there is an action potential in the postsynaptic cell, which leads to the back action potential. So that's why a single input can cause, uh, can cause LTD. Uh, yeah, D LTD or LTD. Yep. Yeah, I think that's the difference between that's the bursts. The difference. Um, so if I go a little bit into more details, if you have an incoming action potential from an axon that synapse onto a, a dendrite, if uh, you depolarize the axon but doesn't do much on the level of the postsynaptic uh, dendrite, then you're going to have depression. And if it generates, your other neurons generate an action potential, then you're going to have fire of the first, fire of the second, and that's going to reinforce the synapse. 
is that always going to happen? Because it seems like a neuron has got lots of synapses and it's getting a fairly high volume of inputs. So is, is any time it gets an input and then it doesn't spike within some time frame, is that always causing depression? Uh, I don't think we know the answer to that question. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not positive. I'm confident to say with 100% confidence that uh, it's the case. Um, the thing is that it's one of the mechanism and there are other mechanisms on shorter or longer time scale that will interact. And so, for example, if, this, if a spine, we're talking about usually about spines um, for, for those type of uh, modification. If the spine that's just on the side might receive stimulation uh, it might affect this one here. So um, yeah, let's let's say I'm not sure. <laughs> and, and and this is a really big field, right? And so there's yeah. multiple types of neurons. And I, I was know. trying to keep. I was trying to keep it high level and not go into too yeah, much well, detail because we start it, talking about DNA, we're getting pretty low level. Yeah. Here. So <laughs> well, yes and no. Um, I mean, it, uh, you have to understand that some changes are, are transient and some changes are more yeah, long lasting. I think that's right. Because are, that's what I was trying to summarize it. Some are yeah. chemical and some actually change the structure of the synapse. Yes. And uh, well, how, well, adding new, trans, adding new gates, all, for example. Yeah, all change the structure of the synapse in one way or another. Some are more long lasting because they're going to change how the DNA of that cell is expressed, basically. Yeah. Well, because they grow new features. Right? Yes, they grow new because cells. you grow new spine, you grow new connections, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you insert new um, uh, receptors. So for example, the ampi receptors here, you can yeah. insert more, more of them at the synapse. If you have more of them, when you have incoming neurotransmitters, they uh, interact with that receptor more and you're gonna have more channel open. So the depolarization is gonna be more important. Does it make sense? Yeah. To everyone. So yeah, and um, again, this is some, this is something that's typically not modeled in deep learning. This short-term versus long-term changes. Uh, I think it's a really interesting, uh, uh, you know, mechanism. Well, I don't know if you want to get if you're going to get to it, Jeremy. But yeah, one of the the biggest disconnects between neurons and artificial neural networks is the fidelity and the dynamic range of synapse. Right, the dynamic range of a synapse is really low, and uh, and it's um, and it's very you know, it's just very low, and so you couldn't represent one or two or three digits of accuracy in a synapse. It's just not even possible. They're just noisy things that kind of work and don't work, and you know, yes, there's a chain, but not much. <laughs> you know, yeah. So actually, we've always we've always gone back to modeling more of the growth of the synapse, which is a big chain, right? You guys know more. I'm, I'm not going to touch on quant, um, the quantum release of synapse neurotransmitter, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I can do that later on. No, um, I, I just I just want to we're going to try to relate things to deep, deep learning. Yeah. The idea that synapses are accurate two digits of precision, forget it. Well, deep learning is 32 bit precision. All right, forget <laughs> it. It's just not never even going to get close. You'd be lucky to get you know four states of activation. I mean, it's like you know, it's nothing like. I'm just pointing it out. It's, it's, yeah. It's, uh, just throwing a connection it's, it's not it's very precise. Noting, yeah. It's worth noting that there is also work in deep learning where you add noise to the activation function. Yeah. And but, this actually is proposed to have that. No, I understand that too. But in the end, what are the synapses? I, I, I'm not saying deep learning can't be useful. I'm just saying in the end, if the, if the system requires, super type pointing out, like, oh, yeah, they don't model these two types of the short term and long term plasticity. Um, but another big shortcoming is they don't model, um, you know, the precision that's required, even if it's hard to add noise, the precision that you end up using is just non-existent in the brain anywhere. Totally. I'm, I'm also not, I'm just trying, drawing the... No, I'm just, we're just pointing out so I don't get educated. Could, could I ask uh, one more question? Uh, when the synapse strengthens, do we see that it produces a stronger result or an earlier result? Stronger. In other words, it... Huh? Stronger. Stronger. So the timing doesn't change uh, if you have more synapses. It's 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 a uh, question of just 
You mean the timing of uh, en enough uh, to trigger something, you know, in the in the uh, in the uh, cell body itself. In other words, is it? I'm I'm trying to distinguish a subtle point between mm -hmm. um, whether let me put the video on so you can see my hands. Whether it's 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 sheerly you know a strength as in a weight uh, that we do in machine learning, or is it a subtle thing in saying, hey, it can fire earlier, and therefore maybe get ahead of some of. In other words, are the, are those effects separate, interlinked, or not important? The difference. Um, in the case of one synapse, you, you rarely going to have one synapse doing all the work. That's uh, mm -hmm. going to be the exception. Uh, usually you need multiple synapses. So the difference is going to be if, uh, let's take free synapse. If you need free synapse to activate around the same time to, to create a depolarization sufficient to create an action potential. Mm -hmm. Then if you have a potentiation of one of those synapses, you might need only two um, synapse activated at the same time to do the same thing. So in that sense, it might create uh, uh, an action potential a bit earlier. Yes. The, uh, at the level of the neurons, uh, what matters is at the level of the synapse, it's not going to be faster, but it's going to be, it's going to cause a stronger depolarization. Okay. But the Does net effect on firing to the action potential could be a difference in timing as well as... Yes. Well, Okay. All right. Well, at the at the, it's different level, right? It, it's the level of the synapse is going to be not much different in terms of timing, but in terms of strength. And then you mm -hmm. go through all the summation from the different dendrites uh, at the level of the soma, and then you fire an action potential. The action potential right. might be a little bit earlier or later, depending on the, the the stimulation from the dendrite. Okay. All right. Jeff, you were going to say something? I just, I don't know, I, I should be just quiet. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> I, again, sort of relating back to deep learning and our work in particular, the timing stuff is something we sort of implicitly assume is happening. And that's why kind of this stronger neurons will win out in a, if there's a local inhibitory system, the stronger neurons will win out and the weaker ones will not. And this is one way, and of course we do it much more so with active dendrites, and, but, um, but overall, this our sparsity assumes there's some timing differences in the action. Yeah, but it, it is not to do with the synapse. Not the synapse. The action, does. We are oh. model of the neuron in the in the temporal memory and the context way we we model all the time that relies on a timing of the output of spike, the action, the action uh, uh, right? Yeah. But that's unrelated to the timing of the synapses. It's much more complicated than that, right? That's a set of synapses on a dendritic branch, which causes a dendritic spike, which yeah. then equalizes the same cell body, which then when you have, you know, it's, it's much far removed. You can think yeah. of the synapse, see those little channels on the synapses? There's an AMPA one, there's an NMDA one. Those are like little hoses letting, letting you know, current come in, if you think of it that way. And if you have more of them, then the current can come in faster, but it doesn't arrive any faster. The synapse, it, it could depolarize, it could be a ramping up the depolarization faster, but there's no timing difference in that, in that synapse. It's, it's, it's almost instantaneous. Uh, the, the, it's surprising you release these chemical, mod, these chemical packets into the gap, and then they immediately go into the cell, and there's no timing change in that. It's just, if you sum it up on the other side, it will sum up quicker or slower. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm talking about the post Yeah, I was trying to get back to yeah. Kevin's question about timing. There's no really timing issue on the synapse. Well, that's awesome. not what I concluded from what he said, but I understand it's, from the larger model that you're talking about with, you know, NDA pulses. Yeah, it's irrelevant. I think, I think, but. I think what I said is, is consistent. No, with Jeremy the, said the same thing. There's, the same no, thing. there's yeah. no timing at the level of synapses. There's no timing differences, but the cell body could fire earlier if you have stronger synapses. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, that's, what that's, I heard was there was no none at the level of the receptor. I wasn't sure I heard that fully on the synapse. Well, the synapse is just a way of passing, you know, current from one side to the other, and it's going to arrive at the same time. It's just you're going to get more of it or less of it. So the synapse doesn't have any timing aspect to it. It's the summation on the other side. 
Okay, why don't we keep going? Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, um, yeah, this is like a 12 minute warning. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. But, but we can do it. No, Jeremy, this is good. I mean, this is uh, obviously there's interest in, and there's a lot yeah. of, like you said, there's a lot of complications. Uh, here. Like I said, it, I'm, I was trying to keep a high level overview without skipping too much, but if there's specific points you want to talk about later on, like tell me and I can do like specific detailed point on, on very specific stuff. Okay, so LTP um, is is one thing. It, it, it lasts for more or less uh, time, but it's still quite a bit. Here we're talking minutes, right? But then you also have mechanisms uh, that last milliseconds up to a couple of seconds top top what those are they, they are located on the presynaptic side and if you look on the right here you can see um, three different brain areas and what you can see is for the same very repeated stimulation on that specific neuron at the level of the presynaptic side you are going um, uh, you stimulate on the presynaptic side of a, of a specific synapse. And what you can see is the uh, um, amplitude here of the uh, communication of the synapse response on the postsynaptic side is either decreasing, increasing, or here being a little bit more variable. And so what that means is at the time scale, which is not the same thing as what we talked about on L with LTP. Here we, we're talking about uh, stimulation and, and measures over 100, 200 milliseconds. So on, on a very short time scale, you can have very short adaptation of synapse that have uh, um, decreasing, increasing, or more variable responses, right? So repeated stimulation can either increase or weaken the synaptic connection on a very, very short time scale. And it's gonna, for example, in that context, change depending on the brain area you study. Those, those are cortical areas we're looking at there, what is that? Um, the, one, I, the left is the pussy, so I don't know what, are these are the pussy regions? Uh, yeah, those, uh, Okay, I, I, excuse me, but I'm gonna to have to put some context on this. The pussy okay. is, is the sea snail. It yeah. was studied, it's like a lumpy thing. And it's been studied it's, a lot because the nervous system is very simple and big, right? In fact, its nervous system is completely determined by, by genetics. I believe even the synapses, like many of them, many of them are determined genetically, meaning all the brains look the same. And, and so it's not a brain that rewires much. It is just like this thing that it is. And early nervous systems like this all seem to be that way. They're very genetically determined. And learning in the Ecclesia, Ecclesia can learn, not much, but it can learn, are these modifications to synapses, right? In the cortex, uh, much of the architecture, including especially all the synaptic connections, are not genetically determined. And there are learned. And also we know in the cortex that it, the, the, the attitude has shifted from many years ago where people thought it was like, oh, all these synapses are being modified to now. We, a lot of people, including us, believe that most learning occurs by the formation and removal of synapses, which is a very different process than what you're seeing in Plissian. So it's not to say that this stuff doesn't happen in the cortex, but when you look at a Plissian, you got to realize this is the only way it learns, by modifying synapses. Where in the human brain, we believe in the cortex, most of the learning occurs by the formation and then removal of synapses. And so we just got to keep that in mind. Yeah, I think I'm going to talk to that to the next slide. I was talking about more short lived mechanisms. So you have the, I would say, intermediate mechanisms with LTP, LTD. I was going to talk here about the, the very much shorter duration mechanism that happens on extremely short time scale. And then there's the uh, um, structural changes that happen on, on yeah. longer time scale. Um, the, but it's, the not point clear, but it's not clear that some of the mechanisms, the mechanisms that exist in implicit actually apply to the cortex, right? Because they're studied in implicit. Well, it's, it's not clear that it's not. I mean, it's I, I know, most, it's most it mechanisms. Most mechanisms have been conserved, uh, especially, yeah. especially learning and memory ones. Um, 
Um, I'm just pointing out there's a lot of uncertainty about that. So yeah, not saying um, that there's not there's definitely because neuroscience and from biology comes from studying multiple different animals. There is some variation between animals and between mechanisms, but the the global uh, um, consensus is that most mechanisms are conserved along evolution, right? So but what I, you study no, I, I've, talked to, super, I've yeah. talked to, what's his name? The guy did all this work, um, Eric Kendall. And he wrote a blurb for my first book. And, mm -hmm. and it was amazing how he just dismissed completely um, all the sort of synaptic formation in the, in the cortex. His world existed completely in Plisia, and he just didn't even think about there might be other ways of doing it. His eyes said, well, Plisia shows you everything. Um, well, like, you have to start somewhere, right? Well, you do, um, but at least you can acknowledge the fact that. Oh, great. You know, it's just, it just, you know, this is a sore point for me, you can tell, um, because people just don't think holistically about this stuff enough. You know, they don't question these things enough. So, um, anyway, so we just have to, you have to sort through all this stuff that what people believe, uh, and you have to just look at it clearly. I don't know what else I can say. Okay. Okay, the, the main takeaway from this slide that I didn't want to get too much into detail is that some of the mechanisms, plastic mechanism can happen on different timescales. So you can have very, very quick adaptation, whether it's uh, increase or weaken synaptic uh, uh, connect, uh, um, transmission or, or connection. And the slide I showed before is you can have mechanisms that last longer uh, in time, right? And that's something that I don't think I've seen really in, in deep networks is that notion of having superimposed mechanisms that work on different timescales. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I, the, it, there are a couple of papers on it, but there's very little on this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think it's an unexplored area. A lot of potential efforts. Okay, so um, so next we we get we get into structural plasticity, right, and functional and structural plasticity. So when you have modification at the level of the synapse, one problem is you are going to have uh, DNA modification that are going to be, um, be um, read by the cell machinery that's going to create new protein, right? But the proteins, they're going to be created at the level of a soma, and then they need to be transported to the um, spine that needs to be changed, right? One of the questions is how, do you, how does the neuron know which spine needs to be changed? And one hypothesis is does that- Does know what the spine is? The so, synapse. Right. This is a spine coming off the dendrite. Uh, the spine is is the synapse. It is the neck of the synapse. So a synapse is not excitatory synapses are not on the surface of the dendrite. They're on these little protuberances that come out called the spine. And the size and the structure of the spine has a lot to do with the permanence and efficacy of the synapse. So uh, I just, I didn't know if everyone knows that. It's, it's yeah. I, okay. Just, My I bad. Just want, okay. No problem. I just said it. It's good enough. So. Okay. So one of the um, idea is that there is a way, a biological way of tagging the synapse that are, have been active at a certain point in time. And then what that means is those, um, new protein that are being generated, those new channels, those new um, uh, neurotransmitters, they are going to know where to go because there's a tag on the specific synapse that they need to go to, right? That's basically, I'm not gonna go into too much details on this slide, but that's basically what it means. So um, you can have a local, uh, regional way of knowing which synapses are active compared to the other ones. 
another possibility is also that neural activity release neurotransmitters, right? To communicate between two uh, neurons. But you also release other um, factors, other molecules that will have other effects and don't uh, are not necessarily involved in communication per se. So one of those is, for example, BDNF. Doesn't really matter what it means, doesn't really matter what it is. The point is, when you see here a uh, B on the bottom, an active synapse, besides releasing neurotransmitters that will communicate information, can also release other, trans other molecules that will have an effect on the synapse, which will make it, for example, more stable in time, or will help to grow new synapses. And that effect is gonna be pretty local. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's another way of having local information or local uh, uh, changes in synapse transmission or the efficacy of tra synapse transmission. Jeremy, I mean, in this picture you have labeled inactive synapse. Is that the same as a silent synapse? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's the same okay. thing. Uh, Is it? I'm asking. I, I don't, I've never heard uh, of an inactive synapse. I've heard of silent synapses. And the way you've drawn it, it looks like it would be a silent synapse. So I just didn't know if that's the same thing. Yeah, I think on, uh, most it's mostly the same in my understanding. Uh, you can, an active synapse would be more an immature, uh, a synapse that's not mature yet. Uh, whereas a, a silent synapse might have been active and is not necessarily anymore. Uh, okay. That's a subtle distinction, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it, it matters in the sense that the uh, silent synapse has uh, uh, some of the machinery to communicate, but it's not necessarily using it. Yeah. Well, the, the important point is, is uh, if, and I've made this many times in the past, if learning is prime in the cortex, not everywhere, but in the cortex is primarily about creating synapses and removing synapses. It's like it's a bind, more of a binary thing. Creating new synapses from scratch takes time. Yep. It can't happen faster than like 40 minutes. But we can form memories very quickly. And yep. so one of the hypotheses that we've had is in the, in the hippocampus where you can form memories very quickly, there, there would be a lot of inactive or silent synapses. They're sort of like synapses are there, but they haven't been connected yet. And they're expensive because you've got, you've got this stuff that's sitting around consuming space and energy, but they're not doing anything. But you, but you can turn a, a silent synapse to an active synapse very rapidly. So it's, it's, it's a way of getting around the slowness of creating new synapses is to have a bunch of you know, extra ones you don't know if you're gonna need until you need them. And so on a, on a pyramidal cell in the hippocampus, so for example, uh, they have the most synapses anyway. There might be 30,000 synapses on a pyramidal cell in, in the hippocampus, but many of them are silent. And they don't really do anything until someone comes along and says, hey, we need those synapses. Oh, I got one ready here. Can I ask what's the mechanism for turning a silent cell? Uh, I don't know the mechanism for turning. I'm about to you join me. Uh, I'm actually not 100% sure, but my guess is that um, the molecules on the silent synapses are not all, all there. So, for example, the channels that needs to open for signal transmission are not necessarily there. Or if they're there, there's not enough to cause any, any changes in the uh, postsynaptic potential. But doesn't creating it, it, new channels happen on a time scale it, 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 minutes or hours? No, but, well, they do. No. You have to grow a new synapse. Uh, but they don't well, if you... You have to turn a silent synapse into an active synapse. That can happen on a, a second. Um, so this, ha this clearly happens quickly. I'm trying to understand if the mechanism yeah. you just described can match so let that me, scale. Yeah, yeah, let, totally. Let me go yeah. back to... Yes. Um, silent synapses can be turned on very rapidly. Here. Because there's, right. no, there's no change, there's no growth. You're just, you're, you're doing some molecular changes to the, you know. So, so let's go back to the second slide here. Um, these AMPA receptors here that, that you see at the membrane, uh, 
in reality, there's like a bunch of them, right? But the thing that here is not shown is there's also a bunch of them that are not in the membrane, but that are uh, at the synapse. And those are reserve um, channels. And those can very quickly be inserted into the membrane uh -huh. and be usable. Meaning they're just floating around there? Yeah. In and the cytoplasm or whatever that is? Cool. Yeah. And then when you just grab one and stick it into the membrane? Yeah, you can, yeah. And that can happen quickly. Right? That can happen you really can quickly. Think, you can still think of the, the overall learning mechanism can still be heavy in learning. It's still the same thing, right? It's still like, hey, I got an incoming axon and I have a postsynaptic event and I want to now form a connection between them. And so this just happens quickly. It's, it's as opposed to elsewhere in the brain, it, it takes a long time. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really cool. Basically, so, my question was, how do you get all these new channels and get them in the membrane on a time scale that's fast? Apparently, you yep. can have them floating around yeah, so you don't have to build them. Yeah. They're just there and yeah. you stick them in the membrane. From our, from our theory's point of view, we didn't really care, right? This doesn't make any difference to our theory. The theory would just say, you need to be able to go from a zero synapse to a one synapse. And also, in our software simulations or whatever, of course, you can, you can create new synapses willy-nilly as fast as you want, right? It's just a another point in the matrix, right? So, but biology is constrained by this, a bunch of other constraints. So um, yeah. when we, when we modeled our sequence memory, we, we didn't, we started modeling the idea of having potential synapses and growing synapses. And then we just said, let's screw it. Let's just throw them in as soon as we need them, just create new ones. We're in, in yeah, my original world. point, one of my origin point was it, it's hard to know beforehand what you're going to need from biology, what you're going to need to abstract, and if everything's relevant, probably not everything is. And so maybe that's one mechanism that doesn't need to be modeled or abstracted away because your abstraction takes into account that mechanisms anyway, right? Yeah, we, that's exactly what we did. We said, yep. since we can create new synapses without any penalty and time delay, um, we don't need to model that. Where but the then I back. could I could say there's a counterpoint to that is that uh, inactive synapses might be more relevant than we previously thought. Like dendrites are more relevant in continual learning than we previously thought, and well, maybe that would mean something would change. That could be, but we need a theory why. Um, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I'm just I'm just trying to um, do a point and counterpoint out of yeah. how it was, it was interesting what. I didn't even know about science synapses, but, but until we were modeling the, the temporal memory and, um, and, and, and we relied on creation of new synapses and we knew that the cortex created new synapses all the time, so all the time now, it's understood. Yep. And yeah, you have about 50% um, uh, of the synapses uh, in the cortex that are uh, uh, created and destroyed, destroyed, destroyed at any point in time. Yeah, like once a day. So, so we, so we basically, but we, our, our mechanism for, we knew that we wanted to learn something, we had to learn it quickly. And the mechanism we, we came up with learning involved creating the synapses. So there was a disconnect and like, hey, how could this be biologically possible? So, so then I had to conclude that there must be, there must be something like a Simon synapse because there must be a way of creating synapses very, very effectively creating synapses very, very fast. And, and that led to the sort of idea, well, there must be something like a silent synapse that's, that's there, there's a connection, but not effective. And then I found that that's true. And then of course, then we speculated, uh, I said, well, there, there must be a lot of them in the hippocampus because that's where we know best. And, and then I talked to some researchers about that. And they said, yes, so these, these primal cells in the hippocampus have tons of them. So that all fit together nicely from a theoretical point of view. So speaking of silence, yeah, um, I think we're, <laughs> <laughs> we should stop now and maybe continue on Monday, Jeremy. Does that yeah. sound good? Yeah. Whatever. Great. Yeah.